Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights here with Jeff Hoffer. He's the Panini Hobby Marketing Director. We, we really got into some kids' marketing ideas. And uh, so I, I hope you'll have some fun with that uh, in overhearing our conversation, especially thanks to Panini, but also Tops and Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, ComC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Rating, Beckett Authentication. So thanks, sponsors. Thanks, listeners. Thanks, Jeff Hoffer. Thanks, Tracy, <laughs> for moving to another position that you're excited about and giving uh, Jeff the opportunity to shine in this season for Panini. So here it is. Are there any boundaries of, of <laughs> collecting a Panini product or tops even or upper deck? But to what extent is your collecting on hold or is it uh, oh. warp speed now? I am 100% still collecting. I haven't posted any tops cards on my Instagram <laughs> since I've taken oh. this position. I don't know that I'm ready to have that conversation, but it'll eventually happen. I'm trying to collect less the brand new releases because it hits a little close to home. And I'm trying to focus maybe on a few years back. I collect a lot of Luka Doncic and uh, Trey Young cards. So I'm trying to go back to that 2018 a year and find some of those cards. I don't want to get myself in trouble. I've only been here for two months and I think it's better to steer clear of those potential pitfalls, but I am revisiting some older releases that I really enjoy and uh, trying to to maybe shift focus a little bit, but I, I can't stop collecting. It's in my DNA. Your job and, and the manufacturers are all, it's not just what have you done lately. That's how they make their money. They don't make their money by secondary market of right. cards from four years ago, but they make their money on selling the cards they're producing right now. There needs to be a balance there, even though your job probably is marketing with respect to the newer products. No, I, I take your point. And I, I wish more collectors had some balance. And I don't care if it's 80-20 vintage and modern or the other way. I, I like it when people have a, a broader collecting interest than just only the latest. They want to work their way back and they want to work their way forward. That's always the way it was, even in the 70s. You, if that's still the way it happens, this hobby will be in good hands for a long time. Your kids' crate or other kinds of kid initiatives. I've had people on, and whatever anybody's doing, they think it's not enough. But to what extent are you proud of the things Panini's doing with respect to marketing to kids? In the I, <clears throat> well, that as a father myself, and this is a topic that I, I try to bring up myself a lot of times in conversations with hobby people. It, it, in my humble opinion, is maybe the most important focus in the hobby is figuring out ways to keep children and young collectors engaged and and to not price them out and not not create an environment where they can't even find product. You mentioned the kids crate, which is something that we've been working on and something I had a chance to write a blog post about and, and put out on social media. I love that. It is a hobby shop release. They're not blaster boxes. They're technically cereal boxes, which are a little bit smaller than blasters, but maybe even more loaded with cards than blasters. There's four different cereal boxes in there and some stickers and some other panini swag, three-year-old at home. And I was able to bring one home for him to open. And he's a big sticker guy. So he was really excited about the stickers and he didn't realize there were cards in these boxes. Once he realized he could peel these boxes open and find even more surprises, it was a, a solid two hours of just adventure on his part. But I guess we can always be doing more, but we do a lot of event promotions for kids. We just did the Super Bowl and we have World Cup coming up. And at a lot of these events, we're giving out and really targeting younger collectors. I've got an idea for a kid's product in honor of David Porter, the kid's birthday crate. Okay. There's cards in there for all the kids and uh, all this other stuff. And Panini puts it together and they sell it to the mom or the dad of the kid that's having the birthday. The David Porter twist is at the end of the party, all the kids have to turn over their cards back to David. <laughs> <laughs> he told that story. He, his mom had a party for him. They got the packs of cards. And when they were leaving his birthday party, he, he, he wanted the cards back. Because he wanted to have all the cards. I still think there's a, there's a birthday uh, crate idea there where there's party favors. So the mom just says there are going to be 12 kids there. They're going to be 10 years old. And Panini could fashion something that's X dollars per kid that would have stuff that would be uh, fun for them to open and maybe some way to facilitate some trading there. And then make sure the birthday boy like David Porter gets any grails that might pop up in the uh, out of the crate. Dr. Becky, you may want to trademark this idea. I think that is a million dollar idea. And if Panini yeah. doesn't take advantage of that, someone else listening to this podcast probably should because the, 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 the birthday crate are... for kids 
kid's birthday party. This is a, amazing. I am a pro bono consultant. Like I said, I, I don't charge, but I love throwing out ideas. But that really is from David Porter, your new teammate there who used to work for me, who, who absolutely loves cards. But that's the dilemma of the birthday boy seeing that all these treasures that he wants, if it's a boy, it could be a girl. If he watches these cards walking out the door that he saw being open, (laughs) that's the flaw in the idea. The birthday boy ought to be getting all the presents. I I can't argue with that. I can't imagine uh, a child having a birthday party and opening up the birthday party crate. And then one of his friends gets the big hit and then walks out. I'm saying in the birthday party world, when I was a kid, only the birthday boy got the presents right now everybody walks out with something and when it's a pack and it could be unless they're repacks oh here's the idea okay now (laughs) this is my consulting because i i'm not charging so i can do like the spitballing (laughs) okay here's the thing these are repacks prepacks repacks whatever so you have the cards there you're configuring it and the special pack the loaded pack the jumbo pack is for the birthday is person. the birthday pack. And the, yes. uh, it's not that the other, the uh, the kids don't all just get base cards. They've got to get something a little bit, but nothing that the birthday person would covet. <laughs> yeah, you got the gold parallel in the birthday pack. Exactly. And then everybody else exactly. maybe gets the, uh, so, the red and, or blue and, parallels. And you justify it. Don't make it too good. Nothing right. limited yeah. to l- less than Okay, base cards for those kids. Um, but that could be dialed up. Wouldn't that be cool? Then the birthday boy can't complain. The kids got something for nothing. As long as there's stickers in there, my son would be yeah. over the moon. We've got a winner here. Work it, work it, yeah. Where's so, David? No, he's be probably head down working on the, the next uh, set you guys are doing. But no, I, I think it ought to be fun for kids. And, and then the kids, like I realized, they leave when they're 12 or 13 or whatever. Most of them leave. But they will come back. And that's the yes. boom in the hobby now. We found it. Kids will come back. And they'll come back with a wallet. It's Actually, it's probably a digital wallet for some of these younger guys, but still. Or a money clip. I don't know that people were, do use wallets anymore. Or at least leather wallets. Um, it, it's funny because there is that, that window of time, usually during high school years, where people take a little hiatus from collecting. And it's the age old story. And it, it matches up with my own was maybe you got a license to drive or you discovered how fun it is to date girls, or maybe your friends weren't into cards anymore. And people, when they have their first job or whatever it might be, they want to revisit all those wonderful feelings they had when they were a child and were opening packs. And Panini doesn't want, I don't want, most people in the industry don't want to make it tough for people to come back and, sure. you know, act like they're a loser or something. No, they're preparing for life when they get out of college or high school or whatever and get some extra money that doesn't go to diapers for their little daughter or whatever, they can jump back in. Okay. From your perspective now, from being on both sides of the table, what percentage of the people buying your product are trying to have a self-sustainable hobby? In other words, they're, they're churning, but they're not just buy from what you've seen because otherwise that's a different financial dynamic that it's a hobby, maybe even alternative investment in some sense. But back in the day, most people were self-sustaining. They'd sell something, they'd take the money, they'd buy something. They'd sell some more stuff, they'd buy some more stuff. I don't think it's that way as much now. I think you got people that are net investing in the category. You, so you think- That affects how you market. No, that's true. Your thought is that the majority of people buying product right now are not selling or even trading. They're just accumulating. The net cash outflow for 80% of the people is out. It's a small number of people, I think, less than half, that are making money, that they're making money on cards on paper profit. But I don't think they have positive cash flow. You know, their value collections going up. So again, in the marketing, you need to take that into account. It is. Yeah, I'm on board with you there. I think something I, I'm not used to to seeing, certainly when I grew up collecting, but I hear about it more and more now are, are people, they're so heavily leveraged with cards. It's it's like almost their largest asset. Smiling when you say that, if somebody sold a card, they would probably buy more cards instead of paying off their mortgage. Yes. Yeah. That's, Especially that's, if you sell something you really love and then you need to fill a void there. I, I think you're hundred percent. It's scary. Marketing is marketing into that, Jeff. And it's not criminal, but there's a real desire to to go after these really good cards. Right. Now, I totally agree. Maybe there needs to be a podcast on responsible spending and uh, just personal finances. 
yeah, nobody uh, is probably something that, <laughs> that a lot of us collectors could consume and get something from. But I agree. There is certainly some reckless spending out there. I'm guilty of buying some cards I probably shouldn't have dished out the money for, but I, it was just hot up in the moment, or it's one of those cards you don't see very often. There's so many dynamics to our market. It's Okay, but this is your job now. Do you think that when you did that, do you think you were somehow subtly or subliminally marketed to to do that? Or it came from you? No, I think that's it me. It comes from the person. And this is something I, I talk about occasionally, but I, I try to not be influenced by other people's collecting. Wait, I but- think it's, it, it's important that people are on their own journey and not swayed because you see some celebrity opening a, a crazy amount of expensive product or one of your friends is, is collecting all of the prism gold of a certain player. That's fun to watch, but we both know you can't collect everything it's best to have a focus. It's even better for your journey if you have a focus because it's more rewarding along the way. I hear you, except that your job now is for that focus to be on Panini, I think. <laughs> it can be a broad focus within Panini, but you're trying to get people to enjoy the hobby and they're not going to be all upset if they occasionally buy some tops or upper deck or leaf. No, But basically not. your job is to market and to make these cards desirable. That was my point there. That, But, but even if you didn't do that, people are still saying, Panini makes cool cards. I want some. People have their own desires. And if you walk that line of not feeding the addiction, <laughs> somebody right. wants cards and you're trying to provide cards, but this is terrible. It's like the beer commercials. You drink lots of beer, but drink responsibly. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Don't have that third six pack. And I'm being facetious, but it just seems if you're a marketing guy, you want to market it in a lasting way. If people get overextended, you've lost the customer. You don't want to lose the customer. You want the customer to enjoy the hobby for a really long time, a customer for life. Sounds like you've been a collector for a long time. You get it. That this isn't a summer of 22 kind of thing. This is something you can enjoy. This is a marathon. This is a marathon. So marketing with that in mind is different than a public company is, hey, we got to get some more stuff out this quarter for our earnings report. So I'm hoping Fanatics never goes public. Yeah. I have reason because I think it would upset the equilibrium of the industry. It's going to be a very interesting three to five years in the hobby, to say the least. What do you think could be done better to bring more youth or or keep the youth we have in the hobby and attract more kids to collecting. I think the little kids watch what the big kids do and the big kids watch what the adults do. You can tell kids what to do, but when they observe that you're enjoying this, what used to be a kid's hobby as an adult, that's appealing. If the big kids are doing it, that's appealing. If it's not dumbed down, if it's accessible financially as well as knowledge-wise, what is so cool is to go to a show and see a, a younger person dealing with an adult kind of on an even playing field. Although the adult, in most cases, has more money, <laughs> but not in every right. case. Some of these kids have fist, yeah. fistful of dollars. There's an opportunity for a kid, especially if a kid is bright, digitally adept, let's say, can do the homework and do the comps. They not only would not be at a disadvantage, they could even be in an advantage. But if you have a two tiers where we're going to have this other area just for the kids, it's going to be for the little kids. Now, the big right. the kids that have got their act together, they want to go to the main show. But if you talk down to the kids and say, well, this is just for kids, I applaud what you're doing with the kids crate. I'd expand that. The other idea I had on it, Jeff, is to regionalize it. I believe Fanatics will do that. They already have these customers. They know what their favorite teams are. It's not rocket science. If you're sending a kid's crate to a kid in Detroit, there's a pretty good clue he's a Tiger fan. He might not be, but you could figure that out pretty easily. Would he rather have a pack full of Tigers uh, and Pistons and Lions, the sports that you do? It's a great idea. Go for it. Like I said, pro pro bono consultant, it's all for (laughs) you I had my day in the sun and now it's others chance. I'm enjoying having the margin to be able to do a podcast and interview interesting people and uh, get to know you. Well, thanks, Jeff. Just be yourself. Uh, Gracie's on to not necessarily green. Actually, it's bluer pastures, right? (laughs) Yes. More Kentucky, right? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. 